All right, Entree Architect community, it's seven minutes after four, which means it's past time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Conversation for Friday, March 25th, 2022. Thanks for joining us. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining from, both geographically and the platform that you're joining from, because... Uh, we're simulcast, as we do every Thursday afternoon for Context and Clarity Live. We're simulcasting these book club conversations out to all the places all over the internet. Honestly, we're just trying to break the internet, see if that's possible. Um, so let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. If we've never met before, my name's Jeff. I am either in the construct of the Matrix or Indianapolis. You get to choose. Uh, I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Everything that we discuss, one topic every day, they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. Beginning in 2022, we launched this new thing called the Context and Clarity Book Club. Welcome to the March discussion as uh, Catherine has dropped down to the bottom of the screen there. Today, we are discussing Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Um, so let's see. Let's see who read Dare to Lead. That's what we'll talk about today. Uh, obviously, this looks a little bit different than a Tuesday afternoon, for instance, because I'm joined today by my often co-host, Catherine McPhail. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Often, I feel like I'm always your co-host. When well, you, you are, have one, yeah. when you have one, I'm almost, when you when I have a co-host, you are my co-host. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Phew. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I don't know how. Tell it's... me something. <laughs> did you get an invite today, or did you just show <laughs> I, up? Actually, you know what? I didn't. I just know how yeah. to get here, so that's how I got here. Just showed up. You that's didn't even welcome. send me a link to be yeah. honest about it, but welcome. <laughs> Glad you're here. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We're all... <laughs> We're also joined in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, another Entree Architect community member, Caitlin Scott. Hi, Caitlin. Oh. Hi there. Um, do you want to know anything about me or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> All right. I'm Caitlin Scott. I live and work in Houston. I um, worked mainly in commercial for the last like several years, but as of about a little more than a year ago, I went out on my own. Um, I'm still in the process of also finishing my license. So what I largely do is uh, consult for other architects and that kind of stuff, um, or do the small things that Texas will allow me to do without a license. Um, but yeah, so Entree Architect has been very helpful for me as I figure out how to put contracts together and do all the things that don't necessarily teach you when you're working in the office. And also focusing on that pro practice portion of the licensing exams. <laughs> so, uh, very yeah. good. Yeah, very good. And I invited Caitlin to join us today because I, I think you may have been when I first announced or or the post first went up, you know, announcing our March book, um, Dare to Lead. Caitlin jumped in right away and and said, what a great book. And I, I think you might've been the first. So we had to get Caitlin on the screen for uh, the conversation today. So thanks for joining us. Uh, below Caitlin is Jay Caroli. Jay, you want to introduce yourself? I am Jay Caroli from uh, Northern Vermont, artist, activist, architect. Um, Triple A. <laughs> And I like it when our guests come in and they give us some hint as to whether or not they've read the book. So some have just <laughs> come right out and said, I didn't read it. Mm -hmm. um, some have, have let us know in, in, in some vulnerable, vulnerable way that they have read it. And I like okay. that. Okay. Well, you know, I'd like to comment on that. that um, we just assume anybody who comes on the screen has actually read the book. You do not need to have read the book to be in the comments, but... To be here, you're supposed to have read the book. That's the, we're going to be discussing it. So Christian was the first one here, and he said, I have not read the book. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, I'm you're, talking you're about the talking people about on, on the screen. screen. On the screen. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's yeah. yeah, I don't mean other people. We don't care if they read the book or didn't read the book. Uh, but, but we want them to be part of the discussion. Yeah, Absolutely, you, if yes, you, we do. 
if you show up in the comments section over over on the right hand side of the screen um you're welcome whether you've read the book or not um and one yeah. thing I, I do need to say before we uh before we go any further is if you are commenting right now and your comment is not showing up on the right hand side of the screen as you see us um it's probably because you're in a private Facebook group. So either the Entree Architect Community Facebook group or the Entree Architect Architects and Allies group. And you need to give Facebook permission to communicate with Restream, which is this platform that we use right now. So there's a URL down at the bottom left of your screen right now, chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook. And if you take that and put that into your uh, your browser window, uh, go to that URL again, chat.restream.io slash FB. Uh, a couple of clicks later, you'll yeah, give yeah, Facebook permission sure. and you'll start showing up. Your comments will start showing up on the right-hand side of the screen right there. So, um, oh, I should put that back there. And below Jay Caroli... I see Michelle Slinger. Hi, Michelle. Can you hear us? I'm not sure Michelle can hear us. Oh, we just have her there for fun. Just <laughs> well, so obviously we we got started a little bit late. Uh, we're still working through some uh, uh, logistical Hi. challenges here. Oh, Hello. hi, Michelle. Can you hear me? We can hear you. It's it's hard to understand you. Can you can you uh, introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Lovely. I can hear you. Hello, so Michelle. Can you Michelle introduce Graham yourself? From Grenada, um, the lovely island of Grenada. Pardon me. I'm outside in my patio, looking at my knee from work, and it's strong. Yes, I can. Um, can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> we can hear you, but there's about a two-minute delay. Okay. Hello, Michelle Slinger, architect in private practice from the island of Grenada, and have been an active participant. Yes. Of our intro, entry and of yeah, I'm sorry. Um, been an active member of it for over, I think, six now. I'm really keen to our particular discussion as I look at membership growth in leader. I'm forward to this. Great. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. And and uh, Michelle was another that was very early after uh, after we announced the book that uh, she has commented several times on how uh, powerful she thinks it is. So it's great to have you join us today, Michelle. And uh, looking over, over to the uh, comment section from everybody that's out there from uh, all the places on the internet, I see Christian in on my screen first. And we have a tradition here on Context and Clarity that the first person in the room uh, wins an award. And that award for uh, being the first in is the John Kinney Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. So Christian is the uh, winner of today's Crocheted Bathtub. He says he's just here for the bathtub. He hasn't read the book. That's all right. You can uh, still participate in this conversation. Uh, vulnerable John Jones is uh is below him welcome back john yoko welcome back she says she's driving in maryland careful driving and contexting yoko ed shannon welcome back from des moines glad you're here and Man manuel is here from new york city he says he read the book that's good that's very good um john says it looks cold where jay is and it, it does look cold where jay 46 is. degrees in here. inside or outside inside, in it's, inside. i think it's warmer outside <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully it's warmer where Michelle is. That's all I have to say. She's sitting out on her patio. Um, Wendy, welcome back from Western Massachusetts. Mark LePage from Waxhaw, North Carolina. He says he's daring greatly. 
Uh, Manuel says he still has three pen- three pages to finish, so he feels vulnerable, but uh, now he knows how to rumble with his vulnerability. All right, we're getting lots of hints being dropped here about uh, about this book. Alan, welcome back from Southern Vermont. Uh, lots of people joining us on the Facebook side. I don't see too many from LinkedIn or otherwise yet, so we'll see who all uh, who all shows up. Nicole is uh, throwing us a curveball. She's on vacation. She's not in Arizona today. She's in Savannah, Georgia. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the bananas are in Savannah today. Um, are you now Savannah. following their schedule? Uh, I've kind of been watching. Yeah, You're I think like they're a super fan now. They're on their road tour. Uh, Instagram is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Though. <laughs> They're producing some good TikToks, yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. both on on both of those. All right, well, welcome everybody. Glad that uh, glad that you're here. Mark says he's put his armor in the closet for the call. That's good. That's very good. Nice, uh, nice reference to Dare to Lead. And for everybody else that's out there, welcome to the Context and Clarity Book Club. We do this. Um, we do this once a month. The last last Friday of every month, we discuss a new book. And at the end of this conversation, we'll announce the book for April, for next month. So you'll actually get... I don't want to wait, though. I want it now. I want to know now. I want to know now, too. Yeah, see, this is part of my game. <laughs> it's all forcing right. You all to, right. I usually get to set the rules. So, okay, fine. I'll wait. <laughs> you'll you'll know soon could, enough. We could just mute ourselves until you tell us. No, you it's could. all right. We'll wait till the end. I, I'll give Jeff this one. You right. could do that. <laughs> yeah. um, but but because of the way the months work out, you get nearly five weeks to read next month's book. So just Good. throwing that out there. So wait wait till the end and we will announce the uh, the April <laughs> Context and Clarity Funny book thing is, I think book. I know what it is, but I have no memory of it. So anyway. We discussed it in our team meeting on Tuesday. I, I know. That was three days ago. <laughs> just, just say it. I know. <laughs> Should have written it down. All right. That's all right. That's all right. Hey, Isra's joining us from uh, from YouTube and also Boston. <laughs> YouTube in Boston. All right. Dare to Lead. When we announced this book, we got lots and lots of people going, oh, I'm glad that you picked this book. Uh, I also think it's it's a great follow up to some of the conversations that we've had lately, uh, especially a few weeks ago on Context and Clarity Live. Uh, there's some really, I believe, really important lessons to learn and dare to lead. But um, anybody want to kick this off? What what's your uh, what's your biggest takeaway maybe from dare to e- either your biggest takeaway? Or maybe the biggest surprise. You could start from either direction. Biggest takeaway or biggest surprise from Dare to Lead. Anybody want to start? I have a question. Okay, I, might, what's your question? I might have missed this at the beginning, but Rumble, how does she define rumbling? Rumbling. Does that just mean like getting together and talking about stuff? Is that what it means? I mean, I assume that's what it means, but did she talk about rumbling and I wasn't listening at that point? <laughs> She no. talked a lot about rumbling, yes. Yeah, she mentioned rumbling a lot, but she was there a chapter yeah. on I this might, is what rumbling is? Yeah. I think she... Uh, I'm sorry, Michelle? So, <gasps> so what's the end of the book? She describes rumbling. And basically... So, sorry. So what's the end of the book? There is discourse on rumbling and basically the way that she describes rumbling is basically like having a wrestling match with all of the idea that you're dealing with that you're wrestling with in a group meeting it could be in an individual session as well but in a group meeting everything out Putting it on the table, having a discussion about it, examining it. And she goes on basically just to, to espouse the idea that if, if you get a point in the rumble where it's too difficult, it's so 
to stop, to walk away. Give us and come back. So, so if you I'm strongly wrestling, not a wrestling kind of a man. An examining ideas of an issue. That is how I interpret whole concept of rumbling. Mm -hmm. She she did have um, a list maybe of, of ground rules, or at least they, they came out. And, and you know, one, one of the things that Michelle was just talking about was that everybody has the uh, uh, permission maybe to call time out. And everybody well, walks away and, and takes time to consider, you know, like, like Michelle said, when, when, um, if it, if it gets too difficult. Okay. Well, Caitlin. I definitely missed that part. I think also it's implied kind of throughout the book that rumbling is coming to the conversation very authentically and with the intention to address concerns as a team, as opposed to coming with the perspective that you're defending your point of view at any cost or that you need to protect yourself by not being fully honest in the conversation. I think a lot of what she talks about is trying to avoid things like back channeling by being open and honest and vulnerable, right? Yeah, I, I um, love what Manuel was just saying, because so often, um, you know, we come to the, the business place and we're not supposed to be vulnerable. We're not supposed to show emotion. We're not supposed to um, be fallible. But but she she breaks that all open and says, no, you're going to be more successful if you can come to grips with your core values and your vulnerability and and that was that was a great takeaway for me yeah i'm going to put that up on put manuel's uh comment up there on the screen real quick he says my daughter who is teaching at a private all girls school in manhattan said that this book is read by all the teachers and administrators in in the school and it quotes almost daily as she rolls her eyes in disbelief as as he was reading it um, he guesses that she doesn't see him as a feely person. And this book deals with how to get in touch with your feelings to the nth degree. Well, that would be the perfect person to read it, I guess. Yeah. If you're not a feely person. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the places that some may feel challenged by this book. Certainly. Um, one of the, some of you have actually seen this presentation that I do called Ego versus Empathy. And there's a whole section in the book about empathy. And I was, I was driving back from, from Goshen, Indiana, <laughs> um, about a two hour and 40 minute drive listening to the book. And a, a big portion of that drive was the, uh, the section where she's talking about empathy. And I'm not sure how much progress I made because she would say something, you know, she'd talk for a while and then I'd hit rewind and, and listen to it over and over. And I just, I just thought, because I, you know, I've got to, I've got to talk on it. I'm, I think it's incredibly important that we understand empathy, how to become empathetic and, and all of these things. And that to me was just, was just gold. So uh, if I, if I look back at audible, the little clips or the bookmark, um, feature on there. I'm pretty sure I have 170 bookmarks in about a 17 minute stretch in that part of the book. I always forget to do that. On Audible? Do you the ever bookmarks. go back and look yeah. at it yeah. though? The bookmarks? I, I do because I use them when we're researching yeah. people. Because yeah. but... oh, yeah. I'm driving. It would be great to be able to bookmark something and come back to it because I always want to. There, there was a there was a lot in this book that I wanted to come back to, and so I was sure. stopping and dictating to my phone some of the things that I wanted to remember. And I don't do that with every book. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I will say too, there are a lot of resources on Brene Brown's website, which is just BreneBrown.com, I believe, um, that are related to, to all of her books, but there are resources that are related specifically to Dare to Lead. There's downloadables and all kinds of things. The, um, uh, what, what is the, um, the, um, the values guide, the list of values. I downloaded that Jeff and I printed it for myself and for my wife. And we are both going to pick our own two values and we're going to pick what we think the other one is going to pick as their two values and see, it seemed like a, like a, maybe that should be in my, my, my marriage counseling uh, group, not my entree architect group. But, yeah, wrong group, Jay. But it, <laughs> wrong group. <laughs> Sounds like but a game show. A, a lot I'm of doing what she talked about um, was, you know, she, this is, this is a business book, but it's, it's a self-help book in a lot of ways too, because I can bring this to all my relationships is the vulnerability and, and my core values. And I should, I should bring them to all of my relationships, not just business relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually going through the process of, um, of having a friend come and join me and like working together, becoming partners. And so we're going through the process of like I have a whole stack of values card cards here put together. We're going through, laying them out, talking about what our values are and kind of talking about how we prioritize things. So they're on the same page from the beginning. Um, and what our values are for the company, but also like our lives, like what do I want our lives to look like um, in the big picture besides just working together. So yeah, I think it's very helpful to be able to have that kind of conversation with somebody, especially if you're working together, but like in all relationships. But, and I think that gets right to the heart of, of the book, right? I mean, there's so many of us and having gone through several startup situations where we didn't do what you're talking about, right? No one was vulnerable enough to talk about what their values were, any of that. And um, I, I think that's a, a great way to start it out. I applaud you for that. Thanks. Yeah, I um, I love, you know, I read this book about a year ago. I re-listened um, at least a good chunk of it before today, just because I wanted to be like fresh with it. But I listened to this about a year ago before, really a couple months before I went out on my own. And along with Brene Brown, there are a few other um, women who in particular I listened to. Like there's another leadership book that came out at the same time by Stacey Abrams that I was reading kind of in tandem with it. And a lot of the conversations in both of these books are about the kind of uh, there's actually, I think it's not from the book, but Brene, I saw a talk of hers where she was talking about how they did research into the people who are like the most compassionate, like monks and like people who have demonstrated in their life a lot of compassion. And the thing that they had in common was like a strong sense of their own boundaries and an ability to hold them. And I thought that was very like a very important thing to think about because it's really about like if a person is able to practice the level of self-compassion that it takes to know what kind of boundaries they need to set in their relationships, that means that they have the capability to give that compassion to others, but you have to do it for yourself first. And that's one of the things I really like about how Brene approaches things like leadership. Um, Because I think a lot of times you can see leaders in firms in particular, like getting into a place of martyrdom or stretching themselves and their time so thin and kind of reveling in like working so much. It's not a very self-compassionate way to practice. And it reflects, I think, in the way they end up treating their staff and the people that work with them. Yeah, I I think that's another excellent observation because it's as much as it's about interpersonal relationships i think there's also your relationship with yourself um yeah that's a that's a good point i want to uh i'm going to put jake's comment up on the screen and see what everybody thinks about this jake says the surprising thing is that what Brene talks about is fairly intuitive but extremely difficult 
to implement. Agree or disagree on, there's, I guess, two points there. Uh, I guess I agree and disagree to the two okay. points. I agree to the first one, and I don't really agree that it's that difficult to implement. I mean, it's hard to remember to implement everything at one time, but it doesn't seem doesn't seem that unattainable. I you know I what? I want to go okay. back and listen to more. I think uh, when it comes to being vulnerable, I think it really depends on like the individual. I think a lot of us are conditioned to have that armor on, right? Um, and that's because like oftentimes it's the kind of thing I where the things that help you survive are yeah. really help you thrive. Really good, well. The lag's getting me. Um, but, um, sorry, what was I saying? Um, and so it can, it kind of depends on where exactly. you are, how long have you had to have that armor on, how self-aware are you of your own armor? Um, you know, def like putting your defensive defenses up is something that we learn to keep ourselves safe. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not the thing that helps us grow. Uh, it's hard for us to, because you have to take risks to grow. You have to be vulnerable to grow. You have to admit that you don't know the answer and not be the knower, you know? Um, you have to be curious, and that can be difficult for people, especially if they've been punished or hurt because they took those kind of risks. So I think it can, I think the intuitiveness, I think a lot of us want to be able to have these kind of relationships, but being able to build them in our lives can take a lot of work. So the, the, the part that was difficult for me that I want to go back and listen to is... Um, or kind of those those boundaries around vulnerability, because I may I may find myself oversharing sometimes, um, and I and I don't think you know. And she makes some good points about that being, you know, you don't want to. I don't remember what she says. I remember that I want to go back and listen to it because I want to be be conscious of it. I remember this part about disclosure. How disclosure and vulnerability aren't the same thing. You can over disclose but not be vulnerable. And you can also be very vulnerable without necessarily disclosing very much. Um, and I, th I think it's a very good point because I've definitely been in situations where leadership is disclosing more than is appropriate for me as someone in a position like under that power structure to know about their personal life or, but they're not vulnerable to me in any way. And in fact, I think that they feel comfortable disclosing more than they should to you in those situations because you don't have power in the relationship. And so it's actually ends up being kind of a toxic sort of exploitative situation if you're not, as a leader, careful about the way that over um, sharing can affect the people underneath you. It's the kind of thing that like when uh, even, and it can be stuff about your personal life, but it can also be things like the company is in financial trouble. Um, how do you handle that kind of disclosure with your employees? Like staying honest with them in a way that allows them like their autonomy, but also doesn't put the burden of like them trying to solve that problem for you kind of thing. Get a good memory of the book. <laughs> Like I said, I was listening to it like the last couple of days to catch up. <laughs> yeah, well, me too, but I don't remember that part. The, um, I, th I think this was in the disclosure part where, you know, my, my interpretation was sort of um, there are people that will disclose strategically, right, as a way to, you know, you were, you were talking about how, Caitlin, you were talking about how uh, a principal may, you know, overwork themselves and then essentially they leverage that to, to some end. And, and, you know, that's, that's not being vulnerable, obviously. That's, that's a strategic, almost like a, a driving a wedge and it's a weapon, I guess, maybe weaponizing it. Um, I don't know that she says it that way, but but, yeah, but um, to, to, to listen to the way that Caitlin just explained it, 
you know, it sounds to me like if I'm doing that, that I could be guilty of, of being a bully. But, well, can we have examples? I'd like examples because I'm thinking the same thing as Jay. Um, well, I think it's true, but yeah. but Well, like for instance, like like a real life experience without using anybody's names, but I had like a manager once who, you know, we'd get in the car to drive to a site and then he'd be talking about like the issues in his marriage. And I'm like a, like a, you know, a woman in her early twenties sitting with a man in his fifties talking about his marriage. And I can't really say like, you know, or, you know, I could have said, this makes me uncomfortable. I don't feel like I'm the appropriate person for you to have this conversation with. But when you're just starting out, this is your direct manager. I think it's that he felt he could talk to me about these kind of things because I wasn't in a position to refuse talking about it with him. And so it's the kind of thing where then from my perspective, I'm navigating, where is this coming from? Why am I being told this kind of stuff? Um, and he's not being a very responsible leader in that relationship. And so, and you know, we're human beings. We want to like, it can be difficult to know like what is making friends, what is being like, what is establishing trust and intimacy with the people that you work with in a, like a positive way. And what is something that affects the people who work for you, um, in a way, because they can't share that kind of stuff with you and necessarily be safe, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's think, being self-aware about the way the power dynamics in your relationships work in the office. And then trust trust was a big a big chapter or a big portion of the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I was really fascinated by uh, when she was talking about the difference between um, embarrassment, shame, and humiliation, and that a lot of people use those words interchangeably, but then shame is something you feel shame if you feel like you deserve whatever the person said and you feel humiliation if you don't, if you don't like own that feeling or if you feel like that doesn't have anything to do with me, but that was humiliating, you know? So I thought that was a, an interesting, um, and then embarrassment is something you could possibly laugh about later, you know? So very different things. I, interesting. I will say that I think I learned some definitions of words that I already thought that I knew. You know, I, I thought I knew what the definition was, but uh, I I learned, uh, you know, that that example is a great one. You know, well, there's OK, that's what the difference is between these these few. Yeah. Mm. Um, Manuel, this is why <laughs> this is one of the reasons I love Manuel. He says, I thought it uncanny how the idea China. of empathy. Oh, Go ahead, Michelle. It's going to take a couple minutes. Yeah, it's all right. Wait. Okay. Um, and what I find is, as you say, is the rediscovery definition. The fact that it turns to other material out a raw object. Today, I believe she's covered something that 50,000 people working in her research leading up to the book and out of the book. That, that was one thing that surprised me when I, I looked Brene Brown up on LinkedIn. I, I don't know what I expected her <clears throat> headline to be, but, but she's listed as a researcher, hmm. um, which, you know, makes sense. I mean, that's, that's the core of what she does. And then that research is then uh, translated as, is then uh, shared via the books and the talks and, and uh, the consulting that she does, but um, I, I did really appreciate that about the the book that it, it's this is not anecdotal, even though although I I will say that and sometimes we talk about this. I've listened to the book as I listen to all books that I that I consume. I absolutely loved the audio recording of it. 
um, and, and this isn't this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the book, but but Brene narrates the book, and I felt like she was sitting in the room with me just talking about the book, about talking about her research and telling the story. So I, I think it is a fantastic audio recording for whatever that's worth. But um, uh, I, I did uh, I did also really appreciate the fact that it's very research-based. I mean, it's it's not anecdotal things that she's noticed over the course of her life. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's this is all really well-grounded in science. Yeah, she's a, a researcher at U of H here in Houston, so like H-Town girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. And, you know, I really enjoy the audiobook version, too. That's also how I pretty much consume everything these days. Um, but like you said, like she reads it herself, which I really appreciate. I like the moments where she's like, let me pause and read what I just read to you again, you know, as yeah. a way to emphasize things. I also like just really I feel like I relate to her way. What I really enjoyed about the book, like in my initial takeaways when I read it like a year ago, is just this person understands leadership the way that I understand leadership and the way I feel about it. And in a way that I haven't seen reflected in the environments of leadership. Um, and so it was like very validating to see someone talk about like the things that you find intuitive are good uh, forms of leadership. Um, especially when it can be invalidating to the environments where you're like, I'm not experiencing it though. And to be frustrated, like, oh, I just wish that people would leave from these perspectives. You know, I wish they would trust us to be on their team instead of trying to control us. You know, I think that's a big takeaway too from the book is just that as a leader, your goal isn't to necessarily control the people you're leading, but to inspire them to be on a team with you and to give them the motivation to reach the, like the same goals altogether. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm going to preface this by saying this this is not a political statement, the, the one I'm about to make. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, I, I think by and large, there's a leadership vacuum. When, when we really think about and talk about what true leadership is, I think at just about every level that we can look at that we've got a leadership problem. Um, and would, would every, having everybody read Brene Brown's dare to lead, uh, solve the problem? I, you know, I don't know how many people in in our community actually read the book, uh, over the course of the past month. But I think if we, if we instituted what, or or implemented what, uh, she talks about, I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you. I mean, this is true leadership. This is actually, uh, and, and it reminds me that maybe we should look at some of Simon Sinek's books because he talks about, in several of them, he looks at what real leadership is. Um, you know, not managing, not demanding, not, you know, whatever forms that many of us have seen, again, in corporate, political, family, liturgical, whatever, um, you know, I, I think again, if you haven't, if you lead on any level, uh, there's a lot to learn from this book and implement from this book, I believe. And I'll step off of my soapbox for a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, now I'm afraid to say anything because honestly, I don't know if I'm going to be disclosing anything or, uh, <laughs> Being or being vulnerable. vulnerable. So, <laughs> well, why do you feel that way, Catherine? Why, why do you say that? <clears throat> well, because I know this is the first time you met me, Caitlin, but I seem to be an oversharer as well, public oversharer. And so, yep. So well, now I'm afraid to overshare, as Jay would say, or to disclose in a weaponized way or something, or just be. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, I here's what I was gonna say. So like, I was reading, listening to the book, and it reminded me a lot of um, like twelve step programs, which I've been in. That's a disclosure slash vulnerability, and um, and then it came that she it, she was in them. So I was right. 
but anyway, besides being right, I mean, that's, I think maybe why <laughs> it doesn't bother me that much because it's not like new information to me. And it's just like what I've been trying to do for years, you know, so like 15 years or 14 years or something. I'm so, also a person who shares personal information without really feeling like uh, it's a big deal. There's a lot, I, mean, I think there's a big difference between disclosure that's meant to, like that's manipulative and just mm -hmm. being very honest about the things that you experience, like things like being in a, um, dealing with addiction, dealing with mental health stuff. Like, I think there's a lot actually of value in being honest about those kind of things. Yeah, but I do it, too, like, because you people, can help people, right? Mm -hmm. Who need help. So, and it's like, those are things that we like have a culture of shame around. Mm -hmm. that by speaking about, we kind of help to dismantle that shame, which mm -hmm. shame is the thing that, like, I think she talks about this too, the way that shame is really the driver of addiction a lot of times, the thing that underlies that. Yeah. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to to leave off on like that, to, to be honest about things that are taboo necessarily, or that we have like a culture of shame around is the same thing as like disclosing um, you will like kind of what she's saying. There's a difference between disclosure and vulnerability and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but yeah. it's all about kind of the, the intent, like the why. And I think, you know, that like when you're sharing, like, I wouldn't want you to be afraid of that. I think you can intuit when you're being honest for, uh, like the reasons of connection or like, there's a lot of good ways to share. I, I guess I'm just like, I don't want to discourage people from sharing things. Well, it won't last long if I'm discouraged anyway. I'll forget about it in a couple of days. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, I mean, that example you gave of the, your, your manager in the car with you talking about his marriage, that is completely not appropriate. Yeah. So, yeah, I recognize that it's not. John also overshares. Well, see, this is why we can all be friends, John. And if yeah. Jay overshares, yeah. that's why I like you, Jay. Yep, we do. Yep. You know who Never doesn't share. overshare is Jeff Eccles does not overshare. <laughs> I mean, I not just, to call you out, but you know. I just read comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. They're, overshare for other people. Yeah. Yeah. The, so um, together, that's all. There was an example. I, I think this was one of the disclosure examples in the book where – it was a, um, a startup founder, I think, that was going in front of uh, VCs, going in front of people that basically pitching for funding and saying, listen, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. We're yeah. failing, you know, this, yeah. you know, this, this kind of story. And he felt like he was being vulnerable Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose he's being vulnerable. <laughs> he was, but it wasn't, didn't yeah. get him very yeah. far. Yeah, but but she she, I, I think this is a conversation after after a, a a talk that she did, and she kind of pulled him aside and said, "Listen, you know, there's being vulnerable, but then there's also what what are the repercussions? That's not the right way to say it, but what's how does this affect the people that you're being vulnerable with? Right? Is it going to cause the employees to panic and go, well, what do you mean you don't know what you're doing and we're failing? We're out of here. And does it cause someone that that either may have invested or that may have invested to go, wait a minute, what are you doing with my money? Or someone that you're asking to invest to go, uh, yeah, not a chance, right? You, you're telling me that you, you don't have a clue what's going on. So um, th that was one of the examples in the book. And that was the not the appropriate way to be vulnerable, I guess. I don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. It's kind of like when your kids, like you want to tell your kids the truth, right? But then you don't want them to freak out. So if you think something is going to happen here and we're just going to stay calm, even though you might personally be freaking out, but because you're the leader of the family, you need to not really disclose the way you're really feeling. Um, so similar to that, I think. Well, and I liked her point in that story where she asked him like, what are you trying to accomplish by telling everyone that you don't know what you're doing? Exactly. And yeah. he said, I just want them to know that I'm trying and I'm messing up and I'm scared that they won't like me. And she made a good point too. Like when she asked a room of people like, would you want this guy to do this in this situation? And mostly it was people who were in that industry saying, I would want him to at least be saying it to someone though. 
Like there needs to be a mentor in his life that he says, I'm like, someone needs, he needs to be saying somebody, I'm out of my depth. But the right thing isn't to just announce that to all his investors so that they won't be mad at him if he messes up. Because that in a way was a way of putting on armor to protect him from their judgment, as opposed to like dealing with his insecurity yeah. in the moment and what was not working for him. So yeah. I appreciate the way she she doesn't just tell him like, don't say that to people, keep that to yourself, that they're just that it's there's an appropriate person, there's an appropriate outlet for those feelings. It's not all of your investors. <laughs> Or employees or others, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. The um there was a comment that I was gonna pop up a minute ago. Let's see if I can find it. Man Manuel said, um here it is. This is going back to the empathy piece. He said, I thought it uncanny how the idea of empathy, which came across with Chris Voss. So that was the book that we read last month. I think that was last month. Um, never split the difference. Um, what he talks about is expanded on by Brene Brown and pro probably not directly, but you know, you can see the connection there. He says, I also see how she expands on the idea of accountability that I first came across in Gary Vaynerchuk's 12 and a half. And she even got into his half, uh, half virtue, which is candor. Um, and so, Many of you know, I love those connections, right? We read these different books, find these different sources and wow, here's these intersections between, uh, between all of these. Uh, thank you for that manual. Uh, we may read 12 and a half this year because that's, that's a, believe it or not, many people, if you, if you know the name Gary Vaynerchuk, um, he's talked about empathy for several years now, a, a lot, but, um, you may not expect a book on emotional intelligence to come necessarily from Gary Vaynerchuk, but that is exactly what 12 and a half is. It's a book on uh, emotional intelligence. And I guess there's a lot of, of dare to lead that's really about emotional intelligence as well. I just saw something about a ham fold over. I'm not sure. What, <laughs> I'm not sure what that comment was about. When she gets mad about her husband saying, there's never any ham or we don't even have any ham yeah. in here. And so she took it as being like, that's because she's oh. a bad wife and she hasn't gone shopping, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So and she kind of overreacts. But her very yeah. evolved yeah. husband, you know, broke it down for her. So <laughs> that was a nice story. Yeah, yeah I appreciate I appreciate yeah. the. It is very critical what you address in there, Catherine, because it's one of the big things for me. In that. What she was addressing there, the narrative in your head, what the stories that you are telling yourself which may go inside the reality of what is happening. But you're reacting to your narratives as opposed to stepping back at the information that is available and as human beings. The first person that speaks to us is a narrative in our heads. Once we recognize that that narrative is always there, is accurate. We can modulate it and therefore then impact our risks. Yeah, that was that was that was the point of that of that ham fold over story, and that's that's a great analysis of it. That it's the stories in our head. Um, we all do it. We all do it. We all make up our own little scenario of what's going on and why that person said that. And it has nothing to do with reality. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do want to know what a ham fold over is though. <laughs> is it like cheese in between ham? You just like take the ham, fold it over stuff like mustard and mayonnaise and some cheese. So whatever you want it to be, Catherine. Yeah. 
I like the part of the book too. I appreciate how often she uses her own like the things that she struggles with to make a point of like to make her point. I really like the part where she talks about the people who work with her on her team telling her that she's not good at time management and that the um, time goals that she's setting are not sustainable for them. And, um, you know, basically how like her instinct, cause she feels, and I also have the same kind of thing where it's like, that's the thing I know I struggle with. And so I feel insecure about it. And I could feel defensive if someone calls me out on that because I want to do this right. I want to be the right kind of leader who doesn't put people in bad situations. Um, but she has to really listen to them because they're telling her, like, you make us feel like a dream killer when we can't meet these goals that you've set that we didn't get to input into. And having, like, a very honest team, and I, I think that says a lot about, like, the kind of environment she's created for the people who work with her. Who, they can feel safe enough to say, like, the things that you do have an impact on us and that she's able to like actually listen to them. And I think it's just a very good example of how like, even when you are a person who's very open and emotionally intelligent, the way Brene Brown is, you're still going to come up on things that you feel insecure and sensitive about. And you're going to have to look at yourself again and ask yourself, why am I reacting this way? Um, and sometimes it'd be painful and embarrassing. <laughs> I I think maybe above anything else is it's such yes. a it's such a human discussion um which which is the point but it and you know as you were as you were saying that Caitlin I was recalling that story in my mind and and thinking that sounds like a really great place to work it mm -hmm. sounds like a really great workplace which is the point. I mean, you know, how do you, how do you build these or whatever you do, how do you evolve these workplaces um, where you can share and everybody can, um, I, what did she call? Um, it was um, the, the um, oh, I forget what it was now, but, but What's it going to take to get this done? Basically, what is what is success? Painting, is what it it painting like. success. Wait, what does it look like? Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, the, and, those stories I thought were amazing as well. Yeah, what does done look like? That makes so much of a difference because it's very open ended. Otherwise, and how many times have I been disappointed when someone didn't do something the way I thought they would? But I didn't exactly say what it would look like at the end. You know, so mm -hmm. that's a very important point. And yeah, I like I'm how it goes from like kind of you telling someone what to do and then they try to accomplish it without a conversation to that person following up with, can you paint done for me? Where you explain what done is. But from there she goes into, but really the most effective thing is having a conversation between the two people about what needs to get accomplished so that there's feedback from both sides. So it's not just a directive from someone saying, I'm delegating this to you, do it. Here's how you do it. But also like giving them the space to input what done looks like too. So that you like can see the things that might come up that you have a blind spot for. And it's much more collaborative. Yeah, yeah. And also, I don't remember if it was, I think it was talking about success, but, but basically what are we actually trying to accomplish? I mean, I we have conversations all the time about, okay, this, 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 and this, and maybe this is what done looks like. Maybe that's, that's this part of that, but okay, we can do this, this, and this, and this, but is that actually going to accomplish the result that we're looking for? Or is it just checking the boxes? Um, I, that, that, that's, you, you use the word collaborative and I think that's another big takeaway. It's all of this is hundred percent about collaboration. Yeah, here in Houston, um, I've been a part of the Women in Architecture Committee at our local AIA for a long time, and last year I was the chair. But a big part of what I've been doing there was programming our annual equity series, which what? is a panel discussion workshop. And um, we did a subject a couple of years ago called Me to We, 
which was kind of discussing like a shift in leadership style from like kind of, especially particularly in architecture where we have like a hero architect kind of archetype that, you know, at least our universities are trying to sell us is like the desirable thing for us to want to have. But then like the very real um, need in architecture for us to act collaboratively. And we see that when we're working with our consultants and stuff like that, but also like within our own offices, within our own kind of leadership styles, how much more effective collaboration is than like top down hierarchical methods of, I just tell you what to do and you just do it. And that should, you should just be able to do what I want from you. You know? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I, Catherine just messaged me and said, Hey, yeah. we're past the hour, which it's a good thing that she did because otherwise we might still be here oh. six o'clock. Well, that's um, part of my job is to let you know what time it is. So. Yes. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, I don't Siri. want to leave without, without, without my, <laughs> she just, my, she, Siri just she revealed just that you can stay on another call. hour. No, she yeah. said, you don't have anything on your calendar. It's just 6 PM. Oh, so she's, nice she's job, right. Siri. We can just keep talking. Anyway, right, sorry, Jay. Go. What were you going to say? So, 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 and I, and I don't want to ruin the end of the book for it. I think, right, I think Manuel had three pages left. And at the end of the book, she says, jump into the fray. Um, Choose the great adventure of being brave and afraid at the same time. And I, yeah. I, I have a tattoo on my back of two characters, and they're both holding on to a balloon. And one of them looks scared to death, and one of them is cheering. And, and that's exactly what it is. is they're, they're, they're on the adventure, and they're, you know... Exactly it's a description for my life. It always has been. And so I, I was, I was, I was, that really hit home when she said that at the end of the book. Yeah. Now I really want to see that tattoo now, Jay, but. <laughs> that might be yeah, over yeah. sharing. But, that might be. But... <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know that if was... that's disclosure. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. I... <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It, it, there, there are uh, the Teddy Roosevelt quote, which I should have had pulled up, but I don't. Um, um, the, you know, the people that are are not in the fray. Um, however, that quote goes. That was one that really struck me. Um, and Wendy shared a comment here, and I think this is totally appropriate for our community here. It says one quote I wrote down. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. And um, I think that's a fantastic takeaway as well. And again, I think this, that's a great application for our community, right? It's, there's, there's no ask in context and clarity and entree architect for anyone to, to conform, you know, to, an archetype or anything else you know, to uh, use Caitlin's word from a minute ago. Um, we just want you to show up, right? Show up who you are and bring your experiences and concerns and all of those things and add to the conversation. And we thank you. Uh, we thank you for that. Thank you for being part of this community. Um, it's the reason that we get to have context and clarity live every Thursday afternoon. It's the reason that we get to have the book club now the last Friday of every month. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. And I guess before we wrap it up, Catherine's about to jump out of her chair. That was me reminding you to tell us what the book is called. <laughs> this, this is me leaning I, I, in. <laughs> I, I have waited as long as I could possibly wait. I wait six <laughs> minutes longer than I thought I could possibly wait. I, I know. I, I've just been. I've been waiting for this to boil over. <laughs> so, so thank you for discussing "Dare to Lead" by Brene Brown and and reading it. For those of you that have read it, if you haven't read it, please read it. Um, I think I think it is uh, something that you can really benefit from. The book for the Context and Clarity Book Club for April, right? For April, which we will oh. discuss oh on my gosh. <laughs> Friday, April 29th. Oh, so I you actually have book. you have five weeks to read this. It should not take you nearly that long. <clears throat> and now we've got a commercial break. 
<laughs> we'll to be, right be continued. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the cliffhanger. Um, Stephen Covey, The Seven oh, Habits of Highly Effective People. I remember people. now. She Ooh. brings some up in the book, too. I think it's a good natural shift. Yep. <laughs> she does. She does. So, um, of course, I'll we'll publish you know posts about this, but uh, you have five weeks and seven habits. Read. So that's like one point four <laughs> habits a week to read about. <laughs> okay, right? is that right? Yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey it will be our uh, April context and clarity book club book. Oh, I can't so believe pick, how we're getting through this year so fast. We're already talking about the end of uh, April. Yeah, it's it's 2022 uh, is my year though, so I better hurry up. There you go. There you go. So awesome. um let me bring Michelle. She's popped back. Let me bring her back. Um thanks everybody. Appreciate <laughs> you. Thanks for uh being a part of this. Caitlin, thank you for joining us here on screen. Thanks. thanks. Jay, yeah. thank you for joining us here on screen. Michelle, thank you for joining us here on screen. Catherine, thank mm. you for showing up, even though you didn't get an invite. I'll always be here. <laughs> thank you. I'll always show up. Thank you for that. Um, thanks, everybody. Really do appreciate all of you for uh, for this opportunity to do this. Um, of course, we'll be back Monday. Our guest for Context and Clarity Live will be Shajay Bujan who is an associate director at Zaha Hadid Architects and a co-founder and head of computation and design at ZHA Code. Um, he speaks extensively on blockchain opportunities for architects. So we're going back, we're going back to the high tech world, uh, but I think you're going to want to uh, join us for this conversation on uh, Thursday, March 31st with Shajay Bujan. Of course, I will post about this tomorrow morning give you a little bit of, of background and ask you, what do you want to talk about next week? So make sure you look for that post, respond to that comment on that post as we uh, craft next week of context and clarity conversations. But until then, everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for being here. Um, find a little bit of time to breathe and relax and find a way to get rejuvenated because we're going to do this all again next week. Um, mm -hmm. Please take care of yourself. Be well. Stay safe. Keep those around you safe and well. And um, hope you do have a great weekend. Ed says, go Cyclones. Iowa State must be playing either now or later tonight. So um, watch a little basketball if that's your thing. All right. Thanks, everybody. I hope I'll see you somewhere sometime soon. Thanks.